morning I want to talk about your resurrection life. Uh, Pastor Rene spoke about that, what the resurrection means to me. He spoke about that last week and talked about resurrection life. Last Sunday we celebrated Resurrection Sunday. We celebrated Easter. Uh, by the way, uh, Tian Xin, go ahead and add another ver a scripture at the end, uh, New Living Translation, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. That'll be later, okay? Just giving you, giving you a heads up on that. Um, and so Pastor Rene spoke about what the resurrection means to me and we celebrated Resurrection Sunday, we celebrated Easter last week. Coming up in a few days, on Thursday, we are going to celebrate, participate in, and witness water baptism. One of our favorite events, really, no joke, that's one of my favorite parts about being a pastor and, and working and serving in Lighthouse. It's water baptism. So we're going to walk out with people to the waters of, at Lungke, at, at the beach at Lungke. We're going to go out. Oh, the water is quite uh, gentle at Lungke, so we can go out a little bit further. Not like, not like a, a pari where um, you saw the waves that were, you know, almost as high as one or two stories, and we had to go no, 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 uh, no deeper than about knees. At Lungke, we can go to right about here, and you're going to watch your pastors take people. And as they give their testimony and as we pray, we're going to dip them under the water. We're going to lift them back up again as a symbol of the new life that they have in Christ. And we're all going to be witnesses to that. And it's a wonderful, wonderful time. So as we think about what we've just celebrated last Sunday and we look ahead to what we're going to celebrate in just a few days, what better time to talk about our resurrection life in Christ Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about today, your resurrection life. And as we turn this morning to some of the scriptures, uh, let's look at Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Um, I, I went back and checked my notes. I think I spoke last year also for the water baptism message. And I, I'm going to touch on that again today, uh, just a little bit, and then we're going to move on. And I, I don't mind coming back to these things again, because this is something we only do once a year. And this is such an integral, such an important part of our lives as, as Christians. So I want us to go back and look at this because water baptism is a one-time, it's to be a one-time event, but the truth of baptism should be walked out, lived out, and worked out in your life and my life every single day as a Christian. So that's what we want to look at this morning because the baptized life is resurrection life. That's what it is. The baptized life is resurrection life. In fact, I almost called my message, I almost titled it the baptized life instead of your resurrection life. But really it's, it's the two are the same thing. And so I want us to go back to some things that I did talk about, uh, I think about a year or so ago. And we look at the command of Jesus. And we're going to look at two different things this morning. We're going to look at the command of Jesus and the example of Jesus. Okay, And some other things as well, but these two as we look at resurrection life. So we're going to look first at the command of Jesus. And uh, looking from New Living Translation mostly today, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. So is this before or after Jesus has gone to the cross and is, resur is resurrected? Before or after? It's a trick question, right? You have to go back and check your Bibles. It's after. Jesus has gone to the cross. He has been raised from the dead. And we're going to look at why it's so clear that it's after in just a minute. Let's, shall, we, shall we read it together this morning? Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
So we look at this wonderful command, that, uh, as sometimes it's called the Great Commission, isn't it? Um, and this is often, when there are missionary services, this is often quoted and this is often talked about in missionary services. But this is a call and a command to every disciple of the Lord. Did you know that? It's not just to Pastor Renee and to me. This is to you as well. This is to each one of us if we say, I follow God. I am God's child. So Jesus tells his followers, then and now, make disciple, go and make disciples of all nations. To do this, they're going to have to go, first of all, or else the gospel will never spread. All the disciples will only be Jewish. Uh, so at some point, any Jews here today? Any Jews here today? No Jews here today. Okay, so at some point in your unless you have a secret genealogy that we don't know about, but I don't think so. But you know, it's very probable that in this group, some of us have some Jewish blood, probably. You know, who knows, who knows about our ancestors? We don't know. But at some point in your spiritual ancestry, somebody who was Jewish had to tell somebody who wasn't Jewish. And that came all the way down to you and to me this morning. So somebody at some point followed the command of Jesus. How are they going to make disciples? They will be baptized and they will be taught. Look at this carefully. The teaching will bring obedience to Jesus' commands in the lives of the disciples. That's what teaching is to do. Teaching the truth under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit should bring a response of obedience in your life and in my life, in everybody's life. Not just pastors tell you what to do, but as pastors receive teaching. I can tell you, I don't know about Pastor Renee's how he prays because I'm not around him when he's praying before he prepares the message, but I can tell you what he does. I can tell you he does what I do. When I pray before I preach, let me tell you what I always pray. I always pray, God, apply this truth to my heart. Lord, work this out in my life. This morning I was praying, God, help me to live the resurrected life. Lord, work this in my life. Because this is for us as well. This is for pastors as well. It's for each one of us. And so the teaching brings obedience as we respond to truth and to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I, I, we look at this, and I asked you first of all, was this before or after Jesus went to the cross? And you all kind of looked at me, mm, and you needed to check your Bibles. Very, very clearly afterwards, and I'll tell you why. Look at what Jesus says in verse 18. What does he say? I have what? I have been given all authority. When was Jesus given all authority? After he went to the cross in full obedience, he was completely submitted himself to the will of the Father. He was crucified. He died. He was buried. He defeated sin, death, hell, and the devil. And then what? He was given all authority. And here's the wonderful thing, brothers and sisters, this morning, as we look at this. Jesus said, I've been given all authority. And then he talks to his disciples, and he talks to us this morning. And you know what he says to us? He says, I've been given all authority. Now you go, and I am with you. What is Jesus saying then and now? Jesus is saying to you and to me, I have been given all authority, and when you work with me, and when you go at my direction, I give you all authority as well. I give you authority to go to all of these places. I give you authority to speak my words. I give you authority to preach. I give you, you have the right, and you have the power. Uh, we just came back from the Philippines, uh, Pastor Rene and I and, and many others. And we went to Iloilo and we went to Mindanao. We went to all these places that are tough, that are difficult. And here are these lighthouse women and others who are serving the Lord and who are preaching the gospel in areas that are difficult, where there are Muslims, and in other areas where just people resist the gospel. But they have gone. 
Why have they gone? Because Jesus has sent them. Because Jesus has given them authority. Why is there success? Why are people turning to the Lord? Why are there Muslims and others and just sinners? I mean, sometimes we say Muslims, but really anybody who's not following the Lord is living apart from God and from His grace and from His mercy. And people are responding to the Lord. Why are they doing it? Because His disciples, who have been given authority, have gone in His name. And because they've gone in His name and the authority of Jesus is with them, there is the response of hearts and people are turning to the Lord. What really encourages me about this as well, and you say, well, Pastor Jen, are you going to start talking about resurrected life? This is the resurrected life. Because some of you this morning also work and live in difficult places. Do you not? Yes or no? Yes. How many of you have a difficult workplace? <laughs> okay. Some of you quickly raised your hands. Do you know what Jesus says to you this morning? I have given you authority. Go. Go. And lest you get fearful, and lest you get really discouraged, Jesus says something else to you this morning. Listen carefully. Jesus says, I am with you you. I am with you. You are not on your own in that difficult workplace. You are not on your own in that difficult family situation. Jesus says, all authority and power has been given to me. I have defeated the enemy, my enemy and your enemy, and I give you authority. I'm with you. You go. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. The enemy, when you are in difficult circumstances and in difficult situations, whether it's something personal or whether it's in relation to other people, the enemy will try to tell you. The enemy will tell you, you are alone as you face this battle. Will he not? Do you feel alone sometimes? We do, don't we? We feel like I'm on my own facing this. What Jesus says to you this morning is this, and this is the resurrected life. Jesus says, I am with you. You're not on your own. This battle is not yours alone to fight. Jesus is with you where you are because he's called you to go. And so you stand and you fight and you show God's love and you live God's life and Jesus is with you. Amen? Amen. Amen. This, that was a little pitiful, but it's true nevertheless. That's the resurrected life. And I want to encourage you in that this morning because I know some of you are facing really difficult things. Jesus is with you and his authority is yours because you are his you you belong to him and he has won the victory and so he tells them to go and they go i want you to see one other thing here as well in verse 19 jesus says make disciples of all the nations and that encourages me that's just a short little phrase there but that encourages me because what it reminds me and what it should remind you is this nobody is left out Nobody's left out. We sometimes meet people. We sometimes go to places. We may even feel, feel this sometimes. We may feel, I don't count. I don't matter. There are people that are nameless to almost everyone, that, or, or that are, maybe they're very pitiful or poor. There are others that, there are so many of them. How can we count? How can we name them? There are others because of their wickedness or because of their evil lifestyles that we look at and we think, oh, they're so bad, and we stay away from them. But Jesus says, go and make disciples of every nation. And that reminds us, brothers and sisters, nobody is excluded. Nobody's left out. Nobody's left out. You may say, but they're so bad. They're so wicked. Jesus loved them, and Jesus died for them, and he has a plan for them if they will open their hearts to the gospel. Amen? That's still a little pitiful, but it's true, nevertheless. Go to all nations. No one is left out. No one is excluded. And so Jesus gives them that, this command. And what do they do? What happens a few days later? We see it in Acts chapter 2. And we, we know this. And, and so, as, so just a reminder, underline again. Jesus says, I've been given all authority. When? This is after his death and resurrection. Because then through his obedience, through his obedience. Isn't that wonderful? Through his obedience, Jesus defeated sin, death, hell, and the devil. Amen. 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 We sometimes think, I gotta fight. I gotta do this. I've gotta do that. 
There is a place for warfare as Christians, but so often, brothers and sisters, the battle is won through our obedience through our obedience. And so the disciples obey, and what happens a few days later? We see it in Acts 2, 36 through 38, and some of the verses, there's much more, but for the sake of time, we're looking, uh, we're looking at just a few things. They are, the Holy Spirit is sent from heaven. He is the gift of of the Father and the Son, they baptize, the, the, Jesus says, I'll go back to heaven, and the Father and I will send the Holy Spirit so man didn't do it then and man doesn't do it now. Brothers and sisters, somebody comes and says, I'm going to pray for you and give you the Holy Spirit. No person can give you the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is a gift from God the Father and God the Son, and He is God. And He comes and He baptizes us in Himself. We're baptized with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, with, the God, with God the Father and with God the Son. And the Holy Spirit is given, and wow, what happens when the Holy Spirit is poured out? We see it here, the longest, best sermon ever, probably, with the greatest response. And this is Peter, but the other disciples are saying the same thing. And he begins to preach and he says, Let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts. Why did Peter's word pierce their hearts? Because Peter was so eloquent? Mm -hmm. No. Why? Because of, the Holy because of the Holy Spirit. Remember what Jesus said? When He comes, He will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Do you know what? I think sometimes our attempts to evangelize people fall short. Sometimes I think they fall short because we're not relying on the work of the Holy Spirit. We're trying so hard to do it ourselves, aren't we? We're trying to, we've got to, I've got to get this person saved. You can't save anybody. You can't. I've got to make them feel sinful. You can't make anybody feel, feel sinful. You may make them feel resentful of you because you're trying to make them feel guilty, but it's the work of the Holy Spirit to make somebody guilty of sin. Have you ever tried to make somebody guilty of sin? Yes. <laughs> How'd that work? <laughs> Not well. You, you messed up your friendship, didn't you? You probably did. It's the work of the Holy Spirit to do that. And so because the Holy Spirit is at work and they've just been, they've been submitted to the Holy Spirit and they're under the anointing and the control of the Holy Spirit, what happens next? Peter's words pierced their hearts and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, and here's where I want us to focus, Each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to show that you've received forgiveness for your sins. And we'll read more in just a minute. But look at those three things. First, they have to repent to change their minds, to change their direction, to change the way that they're going in their lives. I, I talked about this, I think, a year ago when, I, when we talked about water baptism, but I want to remind us again this morning. It is not enough to feel sorry for the way you have lived. It's not enough to say, oh, I've been so bad. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be better. It is not enough to do that because, brothers and sisters, we can feel sorry and we can repent, but there's still a problem in our lives. And the problem in our lives is a problem that we cannot handle and that we cannot change. And that problem is sin. And I can't do anything about it and you can't do anything about it. I can't. The only person who can do something about sin in my life is God. And I come to Him. He's the only one who can take care of it. I can try to turn over a new leaf. I can try to be better. And that will work for a little while. But only God can take care of sin in our lives. And so I want to say to you this morning, if you've been struggling in this area, trying, I'm trying to do better, I'm trying to do better, Repent and then turn to God and say, God, would you take care of this in my life? Because I cannot. So there has to be repentance, a turn, and then there's a, t a repenting and then a turning to God. It takes both parts. It has to take both parts. It is the only way to live the resurrection life that we read in the New Testament. That's the only way. There's no way 
There's no way on our own to live the life that God has called us to live if we try, if, if we try to do it in our own effort. It is resurrection life, and so it takes resurrection power. And the only place we have resurrection power comes from the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. That's the only way. And so they, re they believed what Peter said, they were baptized, and they were added to the church, 3,000 in all. How many believed? About 3,000. How many were baptized? 3, About 3,000. How many were added to the church? 3,000. Boom, boom, boom. No unbaptized believers, no unbaptized Christians. They believed, they were baptized, they were added to the church. Belief comes first. A lot of people join the church first, don't they? they say, I'll join, join the church. I was talking with Pastor Renee. Um, I was in a, there was a situation where somebody called me and said, uh, Pastor Jennifer, I want you to baptize somebody. It's really important. Uh, they, are, they are close to death, and it's really important. And I've been talking to them, and I really, I really want them to be baptized. And so I talked with the person. It was a person who was, uh, a person who was very, they were concerned about this person who was very ill, and they said, We've, we finally talked with them, and we've convinced them that they should be baptized. And I said gently to the person, but I thought much more strongly, I'm not worried about water baptism. I'm worried about salvation. Baptism's not going to get that person into heaven, but we're so used to thinking that way, right? Sometimes we think, but they've got to be baptized. They've got to be baptized. Oh, brothers and sisters, they've got to be saved. They've got to be saved. I, I am, is water baptism important? Yes, water baptism is very important, but I'll tell you something. Look at Jesus on the cross and the, the thief that was, that was on his side. One had nothing to do with Jesus. What did the other one say? Jesus, remember me today when you come into your kingdom. And what does Jesus say to that thief who repents and turns, to, and turns in, in faith and belief? What does he say? Today. today you will be with me in paradise or in heaven. Was there any opportunity for water baptism? None whatsoever. But belief opened the doors of heaven and salvation for him. So... I do think water baptism, it's very important, but you better make, better make sure you're saved. You better make sure you're saved. And, and so I stressed to the person, I said, I said, yes, we can do that, but it's really important that they have accepted Jesus. Uh, yes, 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 that's right. And that's true. So they believed, they were baptized, and they were added to the church. So that's the picture that we see. And if you follow that pattern all the way through the New Testament, we see the same thing every time. Remember Philip, the, the, who was a deacon in the church, and he, the Holy Spirit, who, was the, who is the director of the church. You, you thought Pastor Nay and Pastor Jennifer were the directors of the church, didn't you? We're not the directors of the church. You know who's the director of the church? Holy Spirit. He's the direct, he's the, you say, well, Jesus is the head of the church. Yes, Jesus is the head of the church. But who, to whom has Jesus given the responsibility to direct the church, equip the church, and empower the church? God, the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit. And if you'll read the Bible, do you know what it says? The Holy Spirit told Philip, go that way. And so Philip goes that way. He's directed by the Holy Spirit. He's energized by the Holy Spirit. And what happens? He meets someone, an Ethiopian eunuch, and he's reading the Old Testament. Wow, you know what? Have you ever been inspired by the Old Testament prophets? So dry. It's so dull. It's so hard to read. Let me tell you something. When the Holy Spirit breathes life into your heart and into scriptures, the dullest, oldest scripture of the Old Testament whew, will come to life in your heart and in your life. And that's what that Ethiopian eunuch was reading. He was reading the Old Testament prophets. And he, the, he asks a question and Philip tells him this is about Jesus and this is what it is and what happens? He believes and what happens immediately? What happens? He waits six months and learns all about baptism and he takes classes and he says, when I go back to Ethiopia, I will find a church and then I will be baptized. Yes or no? No. He sees water. He says, can I be baptized? And Philip says, yes, 
let's be baptized. And so they get down out of the chariot and the Ethiopian eunuch is baptized. What happens a little bit later? Peter is called to the house of Cornelius. And it, we say Roman, but these, you know what we can say? We can use modern terminology. An Italian, okay? Because Rome is, that's Italian. And he was an Italian uh, 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 army officer. And he, Peter went to the house. You know why Peter went to the house? Because the Holy Spirit said what? Go. The Holy Spirit is the director of the church. The Holy Spirit is the energizer of the church. And Peter goes, preaches the gospel, they believe, and what happens? They are baptized in the Holy Spirit. How can that be? How can you be baptized in the Holy Spirit before you're baptized in water? I don't know. That's what the Bible says. Because they believed and their hearts were open. And they accepted Jesus and immediately they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then they were baptized in water. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the director of the church. He is the energizer of the church. He's the equipper of the church. He is the, he is the everything that you and I need to live the life God has called us to live and to do what He's called us to do in the church today. Amen? Amen. That was still a little pitiful, but it's true nevertheless. And this pattern is repeated throughout, throughout the New Testament. Now, I want us to look at the example of Jesus. Turn with me to Matthew 3, 13 through 17. What happens here? We have the command of Jesus, and now we're backing up early in his life to the example of Jesus. Matthew 3, 13 through 17. Is this before or after Jesus has gone to the cross, been crucified, died, buried, and rose from the dead? Before or after? Before. Uh, that one's easy, right? <laughs> okay. Matthew 3. It must be before. And let's look at what happens. Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River. Where's Galilee? If you had your Bibles, your Bible maps, and you looked at Galilee, you would see Galilee is way up in the north. And Jesus goes from way up there, he makes a long journey on foot, and he comes down to the Jordan River where John is, and he is baptized in water. And John says, I, I shouldn't do this, but Jesus said it should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. And then after he's baptized, as Jesus came up out of the water, does that tell you how baptism was carried out? Mm -hmm. No. He came up out of the water, and the Spirit of God descended like a dove and settled on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. I encourage you to mark that and to underline that in your Bible. That's one of the places sometimes people ask you, Oh, the Trinity. No, it can't be. It has to be this way or that way. Here is one of the places that we see God the Father. Amen? the voice from heaven that talks about His Son. We see God the Son as He comes up out of the water. And we see God the Holy Spirit coming as a dove to rest upon Him so that everyone could see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so we see Jesus coming. When is this in the ministry of Jesus? Is this near the end, somewhere in the middle, or at the beginning of His ministry? It's at the very beginning, and I want us to look at that this morning in the time. We have about 20 more minutes left, but I want us to look at that. And I want you to think about this morning as, we are, as we're talking about resurrection life, because what Jesus does has some, says something to your life and to my life. This is done at the very beginning of His ministry. This is before, really, He has performed any public miracle. This is at the very, very beginning of His public ministry. And what does He do? He is baptized. He obeys God. And what does baptism do? You go under the water. You come back out of the water. Now hang on to that. So he's baptized at the very beginning, and he's our example. And we look at this this morning. Why did Jesus do that? First of all, the Greek word for baptism that is used in the New Testament, all the way through the New Testament, has two meanings, a literal meaning and a, figure, and a figurative meaning. The literal meaning is what? To dip, okay? To dip 
or to immerse. That's the literal meaning. So what does Jesus do? He literally is dipped or immersed. And he's our example. So we follow his example when we're baptized in water. But there's a figurative meaning as well. And you know what the figurative meaning is? The figurative meaning is this. To be identified with. Okay? To be identified. So the first one, literal. To immerse or to dip. The second one, figurative. And it means to be identified with. So why did Jesus do this at the beginning of his public ministry? He was baptized. Now, think about this. What was the last act of Jesus as a man? What was the last act? I want us to put it together and I want us to see the importance of water baptism. I want us to see the importance of obedience. And I want us to see the importance of the resurrection life. It all fits together. His first act was what? Public act. Baptism. Last public act as a man. Now, after he rose from the dead as the glorified Christ, he did many other things. But were those public things? No. At that point, after he rose from the dead, who did Jesus show himself to? To the world anymore? No. Only to whom? To his disciples and to his followers after, his, after, his glorif after he was resurrected. What was his last public act as a man? There you go. He went to the cross. He died. He was what? Buried. And then rose from the dead. Now put the two together as we think about baptism and the resurrected life. What did Jesus, what did Jesus say at the beginning when he was baptized? He said, it should be done for we must carry out all that God requires. What did Jesus say that night in the garden as he prayed? That was the battle in the garden. Really it was. Because after the garden, Jesus, it was settled, it was determined, and he went to the cross. It was, the battle was fought that night in the garden. What did Jesus pray in the garden? Remember? What did he pray? Let your will be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Oh Lord, if it's possible, because of the separation from God, the awfulness of it, if it's possible, Lord, let it not be. Nevertheless, not my will, but your be done. Your will be done. What do we see at the beginning and at the end? We see the same thing, don't we? We see the same thing. There's water baptism at the beginning. What does water baptism? baptism mean to you and to me? What does it mean? We have died to our old lives. What happens? We are buried and then when we come up, what does it symbolize? It's our new life in Christ. What do we see in the life of Jesus? The same thing, don't we? We see in the beginning water baptism. We see at the end not water baptism. Water baptism, baptism is symbolic. It's symbolic. Should it be done? Yes, it is. Does it mean something? Yes, it does. The symbolism is powerful and it's important and it's a physical act that we do. But it shows something that has happened inside. But then we come to the end of the life of Jesus and it's not symbolic anymore, is it? It's real. It's literal. It's blood. It's flesh that's torn. It's sin laid on the shoulders of Jesus. It's a whip that beats him. It's a punishment that is carried out. It's a price that is paid that was yours and that was mine. And it couldn't be symbolic anymore. It had to be literal. A price had to be paid. A cost had to be, had to be met. A punishment had to be given and received. Somebody had to bear the cost of sin. Somebody had to die. It wasn't enough just to say, I'll be baptized, and that represents death. Not enough. It's not enough. Somebody had to die. And it had to be a perfect price. It had to be a perfect sacrifice to pay the price for sin. And so Jesus, rather than symbolically, which was at the beginning in obedience, at the end of his earthly life, he goes to the cross. 
as a man for you and for me. So when Jesus went to the cross, bearing the cross that he, on which he was going to be, to be crucified, that wasn't his cross, that was your cross and that was my cross. The whips that were the, the, the lashes of the whip that, that went across his back and across his body and across his shoulders, they weren't for him. They were for you and they were for me. The separation from God, that wasn't his, that was yours and that was mine. As Barabbas went free, that rebel, oh, we were rebels, weren't we? We rebelled against God. As Barabbas went free, somebody had to pay the price and it was Jesus, but it was your price and it was my price. And Jesus went to the cross. So here we have this beautiful picture. Let it make a difference in our lives again this morning. And as we look ahead at water baptism, as we think about the price that was paid and the reality of the baptism of death, because that's what it is. Baptism is always death. And Jesus went to the cross and he went, why did he go? Because he identified with who? With who? With you. With you. With you. With me. What is the figurative meaning of baptism? To be what? Come on. To be identified with. And here we have Jesus in his last earthly act identifying with you and with me. That's why baptism, water baptism, is so powerful. It's such a powerful symbol as we look at what Jesus did in reality for each one of us. Because he identified with me and with you, what happened to Christ happened to me. When he died, I died. When he rose, I arose in him. That's what water baptism shows. When I come to Jesus, I can have new life. I can have resurrection life. Where did my old life go? It went to the cross. Where was my old life buried? It died. So what, what has to be done with it? It has to be buried. And then what happens? I can't stay buried. There's got to be some new life, doesn't there? Where did that new life come from? It came from Jesus. It came from Jesus so that I can have resurrection life. The resurrection life, we're identified with Him in death, in baptism, because He identified with us. And then we get new life. In Romans chapter 6, I encourage you, would you do this before Thursday? Read and meditate on the whole chapter. Paul talks about baptism. And he says, since we've died to sin, how, we, how can we continue to live in it? Why? Because Jesus died on the cross and he took our sins with him. Have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ in baptism, oh here's the identification again, we joined him in his death for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we may also live new lives. Here's the resurrection life. When Jesus says, when the Word says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. When Jesus says, I can do all, when when the Holy Spirit has inspired the words, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When the scriptures say, go and preach to every creature. When the New Testament says, forgive because I forgave you. When the New Testament says, love your enemies. Mm -hmm. Do good to those that do you wrong. They don't do you right, they do you wrong. How can I live that way? How can I do that way? Because I have and because you have a new life in Jesus, a resurrection life. And it's more than a promise. It's more than a promise. Before Jesus went to the cross, oh, all of these things, there were promises of God. But when Jesus went to the cross and obeyed the Lord, obeyed the will of the Father, laid his life down, died, and then rose again, he rose again for you and for me, that we might have a resurrection life. Let's go a little bit further. Romans 6, 6 through 14. And I want to encourage you and challenge you this morning. Never, ever, ever make any excuse for sin in your life. And I'm not being judgmental. There is grace. But deal with sin in your life. You bring it to the Lord. What does Paul say? We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that 
Sin might lose its power in our lives. Uh-oh. I have a problem. Sin sometimes still has power in my life. I want to make a confession this morning. I'm your pastor. I sometimes struggle with sin in my life. Pastor Renee, yes. is it just a, I or... Do, okay. How many of you sometimes struggle with sin in your life? Mm. So what is Paul talking about here? Is Paul a really good Christian and we're really bad Christians? And this is, this is the point we still got. We still got a few minutes left. And this is the point I wanted us to get to this morning as we talk about resurrection life. What is Paul talking about? Is, is this something that he could do because he was a super Christian and we can't because we're just kind of pitiful Christians? Is that what this means? No. I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Let's look at what Paul says. We're sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you consider yourselves dead. I want to show you two things this morning as we think about this. And we'll just, we'll just keep this up. Um, uh, let's move forward to the next section. Okay? Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. So we're talking about resurrection life. I was looking for a hammer, but I couldn't find one. I'm going to, for, 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 ser for service number two, I'm going to go find a hammer, because I think that's a little, maybe a little more effective. But I have two things here. They're instruments. They're tools, right? Here's one. Scissors. Here's another. Screwdriver. Or more specifically, a flathead screwdriver. Okay? Here's a screwdriver. In and of themselves, are these things bad? Are they good? Yes. They can be good. Can I use this for something bad? Yes. <laughs> I won't do it, Sister Gurley. <laughs> okay. Don't tell her that. I can use this for something bad, can't I? Really bad. Here's this screwdriver. Can I use it for something bad? Yes. This could kill somebody. This could puncture a tire. This could damage the furniture. This could do all sorts of things. But in and of itself, how do I know whether it's good or bad? When, when can it be used for good purposes and when can it be used for bad purposes? Who decides that? The person that's holding it, right? The person that decides, I will use it to tighten this screw. I will use it to repair this. I will use it to cut this so that I can make something from it. And when Paul talks about this, don't let sin control the way you live. Jesus went to the cross and he died to break the power of sin in your life and in my life. And here we are in these bodies. Some people say, our bodies are bad. Do you ever, have you ever heard a Christian say that? And they do bad things. I must beat my body. I must, I must, I must punish my body, right? I must punish my body. And some of us come from religious backgrounds where that's part of the culture, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's not what Paul says in the Bible. The bodies that God has given us, they're not good or bad. But what we choose to do with them can be good or bad, right? Do you remember before you became a Christian? Who controlled you? Sin. You were controlled by sin, weren't you? The enemy controlled you, and you tried to do well, you tried to do good, but you could do just a little bit, and then you'd fall short. But when Jesus went to the cross and died, what did he do? He broke the power of the enemy in your life. He broke the power of sin in your life. So that now, because resurrection life is in you, Erilyn, now... You can, with the resurrection power of God, say, no, I will use this for something good before I used it to cause harm and damage. But now I am free to choose something good with this. My body can be used to glorify God. Before you were a Christian, perhaps your body was used for adultery or for fornication or for drunkenness, 
or for pornography or for drug abuse or for anger or for pride. But when Jesus came into your life and gave you resurrection power, he broke that. Will it still try to control you? Yes, yes. of course it will. It still will try to control me. The difference is I now have resurrection life in me so that I may not let it control me. Let's close with Philippians 2, 12 and 13. And there's more here, but what does it say? For God is working in you. Uh, give me verse 12 first. Verse 12 and then verse 13. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Go ahead and look at this one as we, as we close this morning. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God. Okay, so that means, do you have to do something? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Now verse 13 again. God is working. Oh, that encourages us, doesn't it? Are we working? Yes. yes. Who's going to choose to use it for good? I am. Who's going to give me the power to make sure I'm using it for good? God is. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. And that, brothers and sisters, is resurrection life. It's resurrection life. It is why Jesus was baptized in water at the beginning of His ministry. And it is why He went to the cross at the end of His ministry. That you and I might have and might live resurrection life day by day by day. We want to close. And I want to encourage you this morning. I don't know if any of you, is anybody in this group going to be baptized in water this Thursday? It, they may, you may be in the second service. But I want to encourage you. I find for Christians who have been water baptized that every opportunity for baptism is a great time to rededicate your life. It's a great time to come again and say, Oh Lord, may I live the resurrection life that is shown as that person goes under the water and comes back up again in victory, in new life. May I encourage you to do that this week? Re go back, read these passages again. Read Romans chapter 6, the whole chapter. And rededicate your life again to the Lord. On Thursday, when we gather on that sandy beach and, and we're standing there and we're singing and you're watching those people go under the water and then come back up again, may I encourage you to do something? Stand there and just say, Lord, I rededicate my life again. Lord, my life is yours. Lord, I want to live the resurrection life. Lord, my life in areas where it's not looked like resurrection life, Lord, I want to live your resurrection life. Live in me. Give me the power and the will to do what you want me to do as I work with you. Let's close in prayer this morning. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for the resurrection life that is our promise but is more than our promise. It is our reality. God, I pray that as, your ch as we as your children, we would not live in defeat to sin in our lives, but oh, and that we would not, when we struggle with temptation, Lord, that we would not live under guilt or condemnation, but Lord, help us to see that we work with you as you work with us in our lives. And we pray, oh God, that as we submit to you in obedience, Lord, that our bodies, just like this, like the, the, the screwdriver, Lord, and just like the, the scissors, Lord, would be used for good, for good purposes, and not for evil. Yes. Oh, God, may you live and reign and your resurrection life flow through us, and may we live lives that just as our Lord Jesus Christ did, lives that are pleasing to you and walking in obedience to you, because you are are working in us, giving us the power to do what you're calling us to do and the desire to do what you're calling us to do. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.